I've always had my doubts about the official story they gave us. So today, let's look into the testimony of Linda Kasabian. She was lying to us from the very start. This is Gary Fleischman, Linda Kasabian's attorney, and this is in the courtroom in 1970 as he's coming out from the testimony of Linda Kasabian one day, and he's telling the reporter of how the Manson family kept putting their hands up to their mouth, like, hey, Linda, we know you're lying. We know you're lying. Manson claimed in court that day that Linda was lying, and so did the three girls. And they were making these gestures in court so the jury could see them too. Hey, you're lying. You're lying. But nobody listened. Everybody took it as these people were telling the truth. Execution testimony continued today at the Sharon Tate murder trial in Los Angeles. Bill Curtis reports. The three female defendants, their hair in braids, wore dark clothing today. They and Manson stared for long periods at Linda Kasabian. The lawyer talked about the effect of their attempts to reach her. She's interpreting them, they're constant, and she thinks these signs where she, they touch their mouths constantly mean she's not telling the truth. That's her judgment about it, I don't know. How, how did she I don't care. feel when she saw the girl's hair this morning? Oh, it's obvious to her that they're, they're uh, by the way, she says that's not pigtails, that's braids. <laughs> Uh, it's obvious to her that they're emulating her for some reason. And she told me, she said, I wish that they would not only wear their hair as mine, but tell the truth finally. But there is communication between the former family members. One of the girls said to Linda softly, you're killing us. She replied, you've killed yourselves. And today, when Charles Manson said, you're lying, she spoke into the microphone, you know it's the truth, Charlie. Bill Curtis, CBS News, Los Angeles. I noticed one thing about Linda over the years in her interview. She didn't do that many of them. She only did about three or four of them, maybe five. But when she would talk, sometimes she would be there with the district attorney, Bugliosi. Then she would talk differently than when she would talk when she was by herself. This time she was by herself and she was asked, what was it like? What was it like on the ranch? What was it like with the Manson family? A typical day would be just sitting around lazing about when it would get hot in the afternoon going up to the waterfall you know just uh, dancing around just being free having fun I came from a family of all boys and all of a sudden when I came to the family the Manson family um, I had all these sisters all around me at all times. Um, I really liked that. We'd wow, she comes from a family of four brothers. I have a sister who comes from a family of two brothers. And I can tell you what, that girl is tough. She is tougher than me. She could probably kick my butt. So I'm figuring Linda's probably not as girlish as she comes across as being. I don't know. Maybe she is. And then she was asked, what was Manson like? You would expect her to say, I mean, this is years after the fact now, so you'd expect her to say, oh, he's a maniacal killer and all that kind of things. But let's listen to what she has to say about what Manson was like when Bugliosi wasn't around tugging on her chain to tell her to say what Manson was like. He had everybody's undivided attention. I mean, it was like, oh, Charlie. You know, and it's like you would just hang on to every word that he would say. A lot of the words didn't really register with me. For me, it was more the way he sounded, um, the way his body language, um, you know, how he would move when he would speak. He was just mesmerizing he was extremely exciting and um, I see everybody else must have felt that way also that he was just he would hold you every you know for every second well call me stupid but to me it sounded like she's kind of in love with the dude I don't know man again call me stupid if you've ever done one of these documentaries, you know. If you haven't, I'll tell you. Um, it's just to the point now where they're like, come on, get to it. Tell us who Manson killed. Tell us the other people we killed. Where's the bodies buried? 
they do that. They look for dramatic crap. So at this point, they've asked her, you know, what do you hate about Manson? You know, all these things. So that's where she's going now. I believe that Charlie Manson's ego was such that he wanted more and more and more power. And I believe that Charlie Manson just wanted more power. I think he was greedy. And he just kept wanting more and more. And of course, now I know, he wanted more recognition. He wanted to be a superstar. Um, and I believe he probably could have been had his path gone in another direction. And I think that his greed was his downfall. And with his downfall, a coward, because he took a lot of people down with him. A lot of lives. She says something really interesting right there in that part. Uh, you might not have caught it. She says, I know now, I know now Manson wanted to be a superstar. I know now. How do you know now? Well, shouldn't you have known back then? Isn't that the reason that you went to them people's house? That's not the reason they went there. You know now. Now Linda's going to talk about the murders. But in this interview, she's with Bugliosi. And now she has sunglasses on. And the last one she didn't. She was a little more free and open. Now she's covering herself with sunglasses like she's ashamed of something. I don't know why. And Bulios is kind of pulling her chain, really, and telling her what to say from the very beginning because he's directing it from the very start. It was in Larry King, and you can go back and watch the whole thing. But he kind of pushes her and nudges her along and is like, here, here, say this, say this, say this. This is, this is the scenario that we're following here in this interview. Just listen to her now. She's a different Linda Gazabian. The first one, yeah. And then after that happened, um, I was told to stay there and just kind of wait and listen for sounds. And I did that. And then I started hearing, like, just horrible screaming. So I started running towards the house. And um, Sadie came running out. And I just looked at her and I said, Sadie, please make it stop. And she said, I can't. It's too late. Um, one, two, three... Here, let me ask you an easy question. How many people were with you? And she has to count on her fingers? One, two, three. He was in his vehicle. And that's when I saw <sighs> Wojtek Frykowski being murdered, slaughtered. That kind of a, uh, of a scenario where, you know, the, the only thing that got said was, Sadie, make it stop. I, I didn't know what to feel, didn't know what to think. I just witnessed a man uh, looking straight into his eyes leave this earth. So she's already watched Stephen Parent die right in front of her eyes. And now she's watching this guy get chased through the yard and killed too. She's a murderer. Manson wasn't even there. Wasn't this Larry King? Isn't this the same guy? Hell on Tom, Pennsylvania. You're on the air. Ask the tough questions. Uh, why these people? Oh, it wasn't that kind of scenario. All I said was, please, Sadie, make it stop. What? Larry King should have said, Vince Bugliosi, this is bullshit. Why were they there? Again, the same old crap over and over again. Why were you there? Oh, it's not that kind of scenario. Scenario. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It was Manson's fault. I thought of doing that while I was still there and the murders were still going on. And um, I thought about my daughter back at the ranch. I thought about um, being found at somebody else's house, uh, calling for help. Also, back in that time in frame, you didn't turn to the police. The police was... She's in a conspiracy to commit murder with three other people. That's why she didn't call the police. Come on, man. 
They make these people sound like they're just all innocent and it was all Charlie's fault. Always. And uh, he asked if we had remorse. And I kind of watched and waited to hear what everybody else was saying to kind of follow in their footsteps as to because I couldn't say, you know, what I really felt. No, no. Well, I guess by Manson asking you how it went, you know, that makes him part of the conspiracy now, which he never understood. But still don't make him murder. Still don't make him the guy that sent you there. And it still don't give us an answer on why those people. Never. We've never got an answer on why those people. They've always diverted us with... Black people? Oh, it was the black people. They were trying to create a race war. That's the biggest crock of crap. I don't know why any jury believed it. The jury believed it because it had people on the jury like cops and all kinds of people that would have never made it on a regular jury if Manson would have had a good attorney. And they all, even, even Linda's attorney, knew from the very damn start that Manson had a terrible attorney. He had one of the worst rated attorneys in Los Angeles County and they handed him right to Manson. I think if he had had a competent lawyer, he would have either walked at the trial or walked on appeal because there just wasn't sufficient testimony to convict him of anything. Remember this guy? He's the guy with the hat saying, hey, the Manson family keep putting their hands up to their mouth during the trial, insinuating that we're lying. What well, he's gonna tell you now, they were lying. They were flat out lying about the whole damn thing. They were lying. To talk to her, and the only conversation I can tell you is I said, keep your mouth shut and keep it shut in that jail. Don't talk to anybody about this ever. I can't tell you the conversation I had with her, but I was led to believe that the murders up there started long before the Tate LaBianca case. I can't describe what she told me, but it was scary. The whole thing was scary. So, he says, she told him a story that was scary. He can't tell you what she told him because of attorney-client privilege. So he can't tell you the truth. It's the way the law works. It's beautiful, huh? That's how OJ got away with it, too. That's how Manson got framed like Roger Rabbit. I had Linda pass kites to her in the jail. A kite is a little letter saying, and Charlie talk, Charlie talk being, the DA is your lawyer, Charlie is the DA, nonsense like that. And this Atkins was a little nuts and she then refused to testify. So now they were left with Linda, period. That's why your lawyer will tell you in court, don't take any notes. Don't talk to people when you're in, in jail and law. Don't even talk to the people that you were convicted with because there's always a rat like that that's behind the scenes sending these notes. So Susan got scared out of it. And they got the deal. Those were fantastic attorneys. They got that chick off. Murder. And then negotiations started. First they offered me murder in the second degree. I said, no. Then they offered me voluntary manslaughter. I said, no. She was technically guilty of first degree murder as an accessory before and after the fact. Like, wait a minute. Isn't the court supposed to be a place to go find the truth? No, it's not. It's not a place for the truth. It's a place for good attorneys. And this dude was a good attorney. He was a great attorney. And we never got to the truth. That's the whole truth of this. There, it, there wasn't any truth told in that testimony of Linda Kasabian. He's telling you that right now. He basically said there's a script, a script that was handed to him by the district attorney's office and you go along with this. You can tell Stephen Parent was shot and you can tell how it happened but you're not gonna tell them why you were there. So we typed up an immunity agreement and the immunity agreement said Linda Kasabian 
will receive immunity if she testifies to the truth in the so-called Manson murders. The truth is as follows. I knew exactly what was necessary to convict him. And whether that was the truth or not wasn't my business to decide. That was Vince's business. I said, Linda, if you testify to that, you're going to walk out of that courtroom. Do the attorneys on the other side really care whose lives they destroy to get their own clients off? No. It's not their job. Sadly, it's not their job. And that's not the way court works. This guy did a fantastic job and he got his client off. That was his whole job and he did a great job of it. Beside the point of telling the truth, there was no truth told. You're the one that needs to go find the truth because nobody tells you the truth. If you want to find it, you gotta go look for it. I think he suffered an injustice not really. <laughs> Not in my heart of hearts. But as a matter of litigation, yes, he did suffer an injustice. Whether morally he suffered an injustice, I don't think so. Ultimately, Linda's attorney cast doubts on Charles Manson's ethical compass, highlighting a pattern of deceit, manipulation, and dishonesty, employed to secure his client's acquittal, regardless of the truth. This begs the question, though, do morals truly hold sway within the confines of the justice system? Or have they ever? If you're more interested in testimony, please check out the video of Susan Adkins' testimony. And until next time, peace.